Okay, I saw Anderson already on the waiting list, and uh, we run the time very fast. So yeah, we move on Anderson. Yeah, so Anderson is our second speaker. He's from Hong Kong University. I actually last year I heard his uh, talk the first time. I was so exciting because all the liquid, you know, can. Dance, uh, dancing and even make beautiful songs. So Anderson are going to tell us uh, the, some stories about liquid, liquid in the facial engineer for droplet, you know, uh, microfluidics. Okay, so uh, Anderson, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Zhang. So um, good evening, everybody. My name is Anderson Shum from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Hong Kong. It's a real honor to be able to speak at the ICANX series, which featured so far so many top scientists and illustrious professors that I have admired for, for a really long time. So it's, a really, it's really surreal um, for me to be able to give a talk to all of you about some of our work here today. The topic of my talk will be about liquid-liquid interfacial engineering for droplet engineering, for droplet microfluidics. So droplet microfluidics have been around for quite a long time. So glass capillary microfluidics, which was introduced by many previous experts, such as Professor Dave Waits, my PhD supervisor at Harvard in 2005. At the time, uh, one of the PhD students, Andy Utada, used glass capillary microfluidic devices to generate really sophisticated emulsion drops, such as these double emulsion drops with water in oil, in water structure, in ways that are much simpler than before. And with this technique, with drop the microfluidics, then um, it is possible to control the size of the droplet. We can also make the size distribution to be very narrow. And so the resulting droplets are really um, uniform in size. You can also generate the drop one by one. So you can load the uh, active ingredients into the inner droplet one by one, thereby achieving very high loading. You can also have very high encapsulation efficiency. So the active ingredients, such as the fluorescent dyes you see in these uh, uh, double emulsion droplets, do not get released so easily. And you can also control the um, droplet structure relatively easily. For example, you can generate not only double emulsion, but also triple emulsion, as you can see here, and uh, with different structures. And also you can generate things like some of these droplets if you put some magnetic nanoparticles in one of the inner droplets, and you can then actually actuate these droplets or capsules magnetically. The technique itself is very, very scalable, and so you can um, just number up these channels and parallelize them and have scaled up production. So these are just some of the major advantages of droplet microfluidics that people have taken advantage of for, all, for uh, quite a period of time now. And um, so when I was a PhD student, one of the projects that I was involved in working on was to use these double emulsion droplets as templates to generate vesicles. We first start with water in oil in water double emulsions, and then in the middle oil phase, we put some lipids or another amphiphilic that block polymers. So they tend to aggregate at the water oil interface. And because of the high degree of control of the droplet structures that you can generate and achieve using droplet microfluidic techniques, we can generate much more sophisticated vesicles, such as these bicompartmental vesicles or even higher number of compartments very easily. You can load different substances into them separately. This was not easy at the time. And with this breakup, you can open a lot of possibilities. So um, after our paper was published, there were suggestions that this could be used for making artificial cell aggregates. So that paper was published in 2011. Now is already 2020. So hopefully we have moved a little bit closer towards that direction. However, before we could achieve that, there were actually some major hurdles that we had to overcome. For example, when we consider those droplets that we can generate, how are they different from um, biological droplets? Here are a few key differences that we have identified over the years. Um, in the slides that, I sh that you saw previously, the emulsions typically consist of an oil shell phase that may consist of toluene or chloroform or other organic solvents that you do not expect to exist in biological system. Therefore, compatibility is a huge issue. Another important feature is the possibility to induce drop, um, droplet phase separations, which has been shown to play an important role in a lot of biological uh, processes increasingly. 
Moreover, biological systems obviously exhibit growth when they are living, but similar reliance on growth is rarely observed in synthetic droplets. Also in emulsion science for synthetic droplets, uh, a lot of efforts have been spent on stabilizing the droplets against coalescence, but biological droplets do not only not coalesce, but they actually, if needed, can also divide. So this is something that um, we need to think about if we want to replicate that in synthetic droplets. Furthermore, in biological droplets, at the interface, there will be a lot of assembly processes going on. Can we also achieve similar assembly with our synthetic aqueous droplets? And there are, of course, a lot more differences, but these are a few that I would like to highlight here today. And um, so the first point I'll address is the bio and cytocompatibility issue. And we do that by adopting a system that has been around for quite a while, known as the aqueous two-phase systems. Essentially, you have two polymers or salts, or even proteins, RNA, DNA, etc. If you have two water-soluble additives and you add them to water, because they are both water-soluble, so at low concentration, you just have a single-phase solution. However, as you increase the concentrations of the additives, even though both additives are soluble in water, but at high concentrations, the aqueous solutions will actually phase separate into two immiscible phases. One will be rich in polymer X, the other one will be rich in polymer Y or salt. So if you go into this two-phase region, you can have two solutions with two different or with different concentrations of polymer X and polymer Y that are immiscible with each other. Macroscopically, you will see an interface like this between the two phases and microscopically you see droplets as a result. And this is a system that you can turn into a single phase solution simply by dilution. If you add um, water to it, all these will go towards the origin into the single phase region. And then the entire solutions will become miscible with just a single phase resulting. So um, the interfaces that are formed by these aqueous phases also have their very special properties. For example, a common system is between dextrin and, ge and gelatin, as I'm showing here. Um, you can see that there's clearly an interface between them, but if you go and look at the interface, or at this zero point here, this is right at the interface. Um, if you gradually move towards the negative part, you are increasing in the gelatin fraction. And if you move to the positive part, you're increasing in the dextrin fraction. Uh, fraction. Therefore, there is a, uh, concentration gradient and at the background, of course, you have water as the solvent. And therefore, the interfacial tension of this system, not surprisingly, will decrease as you reduce the mass fraction of the polymers by dilution, because you're gradually going from the two-phase region to the single-phase region. And when you're at the um, single-phase region, you do not have an interface, and therefore, by definition, the interfacial tension must be zero. And as you as you get closer and closer to this tie line from the two-phase region, you are having a reduction in the interfacial tension. And what that means is that the interfacial tension can be extremely small. And when you have that extremely small interfacial tension, you may expect different interfacial behavior. So when the interfacial tension is very low, for example, much less than um, 10 micronewton per meter, all the, all the tricks that I've shown you in the previous slide at the beginning of my presentation, where you see the formation of those nice double emulsions do not work because the breakup of the jet is typically driven by capillary instability or sometimes known as the plateau rate instability, which is driven by a high surface tension. So when you have such a low interfacial tension, you can just form a jet and the jet doesn't break up Various groups, including ours, have demonstrated that you see all kinds of corrugations. Um, for example, even the noises from the syringe of the pumps will generate corrugations in a tubing that feeds fluids into the microfluidic device. And this is sufficient to cause uh, corrugations in the jet and electrical perturbations will also generate corrugations, but very difficult to break the jet into droplets. In fact, even um, something as minute as sound can generate perturbation. For example, as I, um, as I have a water component um, with a very low interfacial tension, um, and if we play music to the tubing that's feeding the fluid into the glass capillary device, you can clearly see that the interface becomes coordinated.
according to the music, the amplitude of the corrugations will change with the volume of the sound, and the frequency of the corrugations will change with the pitch of the sound. And in fact, this was something that captured the attention of some artists, and we actually worked with them during a small exhibition. All these just highlight the in order to use the technique in drop and microfluidics. So we have to understand the mechanism of the jet breakup at such low interfacial tension. You can see in this diagram here that the typical um, interfacial tension, um, the scale length between the jet radius and the time during the breakup process follows a very different relationship than that for a curve. Um, with a very low interfacial tension. And these jet shapes are self-similar during the breakup, and we can come up with a length scale with respect to time following this expression um, with an exponent n. If we estimate this exponent n and plot it, clearly when the interfacial tension is low, we have a very different regime than in the high tension regime. It turns out that this low interfacial tension regime, um, the breakup of the jet is driven by diffusion rather than the more common hydrodynamic dominated process. And this is somewhat understandable. We have two invisible aqueous phases and so water can still diffuse across them. Small additives may also be able to diffuse across them. And so diffusion is possibly making a very important role in these processes. With that understanding and also with some experiments, our groups and also many other groups have tried to demonstrate jet breakup by introducing perturbations. For example, we try to uh, vibrate the tubing to trigger larger corrugation. And then with sufficient surface tension, the corrugated jet can break up into droplets uniformly. A group from Netherlands also incorporated uh, piezoelectric devices into their microfluidic ships to cause similar breakup. Scott size group um, in uh, Ryerson uh, in Canada have also varied the pressure that drives the fluids um, into the devices to cause breakup or program the um, pressure profile to induce the breakup of the jet to form uniform droplets. Um, with the aqueous two-phase systems, if we can just introduce completely biocompatible and cytocompatible additives to induce the phase separations of the aqueous solutions, the resulting, solution, the resulting droplets will be completely biocompatible or cytocompatible. Another characteristic that we have to consider, therefore, is the phase separation itself, which are very well known in biological cells and cytoplasms and becoming increasingly well known in synthetic systems. So um, Cliff Brangwin, Tony Hyman initially introduced a lot of these liquid-like behavior during the development of gem cells in C. elegans and also very active liquid-like behaviors of, uh, in the nucleoles of these uh, centipers uh, frogs. And since then, there have been an explosion of investigations trying to understand the role of these so-called membranous organelles or sometimes known as liquid, mon uh, liquid organelles in cells. Our systems shares a lot of common features. And so we would like to use them to understand some of these processes. And we can also possibly introduce aqueous phase separations in our synthetic droplets. For example, um, what we've done before was to put, put two additives into um, the droplet phase, and then we can use osmosis to trigger the droplets to phase separate again. We can then get smaller droplets within our emulsion thereby achieving double emulsions. And recently we have also shown that you could control the concentrations of, for example, pack and salt in a droplet and subsequently go from the single emulsions all the way to quadruple emulsions. Um, I will talk more about that later. And other groups have also demonstrated that you could introduce aqueous phase separation in these droplets to achieve different structures, um, such as these Janus structures with different sizes of the fluorescent parts here. The idea is that you can first generate a droplet um, th um, that is immiscible with the continuous phase. And because water can still diffuse across the interface, so the interface behaves essentially like a semi-permeable membrane. And as water is extracted from the droplet, the concentrations of the additives in the droplets increases, and that drives another step of phase separation. And this additional step of phase separation can lead to formation of one more layer 
And if you repeat that two, three, or four times, and then you'll get two layers, three layers, and four layers more. This is a video showing a droplet in a micro channel. As water is extracted out from the droplet, you can see that phase operations happens layer by layer. And each time you have a phase operation step, the number of layers of the droplet increases by one. If we try to um, start from concentrations, for example, around here near these red dots, then when we increase the concentrations, we are moving out to the two phase region. And then the increase in concentrations of the droplet uh, will cause a phase operations with two different concentrations, for example, to here and there. And then uh, at the tie line, as you continue to extract water from the droplet, then you can have one more step of phase operations. You can get one more layer. And in doing so, eventually you repeat yourself and you get four layers in this, in this case. And so this demonstrates that with phase operations, we can conveniently control the inner structures of aqueous droplets in ways we couldn't do before. Another important question is whether we can combine the phase operation process with the hydrodynamic breakup process. We demonstrate that with a thin film of one aqueous phase added on top of another immiscible aqueous phase, as, water, as the aqueous droplets spread on the thin layer and become thinner and thinner, transport of water out of the thin film can induce phase separation, leading to formation of these tiny droplets with pretty well controlled sizes. To make more sophisticated droplet structures, you can first induce a phase separation step like this one. And after that, you can induce the breakup of the thin film into smaller droplets. So each of the subsequent droplets are multiple droplets with innermost droplets previously formed by the phase separation step before. With this approach, we can achieve hierarchical droplets with more sophisticated structures. Another feature that we need to achieve to mimic um, in biological system is growth. There are lots of proteins in biological system and in this work, uh, in collaborations with Thomas Knowles groups from Cambridge University, we chose a lysozyme. We investigate monomers to oligomers and all the ways to these um, truer nanofibrils. And we try to add each of these to stabilize the aqueous droplets in aqueous solutions. And you can see if we shake these aqueous phases vigorously by homogenization and allow them to coalesce. Only those with the nanofibrils will remain small in size while all the other have much larger droplets shortly after due to coalescence, meaning that these lysozyme structures are not able to stabilize the droplets. This suggests that only the nanofibrils are able to stabilize the aqueous aqueous emulsion drops, even though all of these structures consist of lysozymes as the basic building block. To understand this, we also add to the fibril, uh, the, the nanofibril, a fluorescence dye that should stick to the fibrils. And with as low as 0 0.025 weight percent of the fibrils, we are already able to stabilize the aqueous aqueous droplets. And if we do not add the fibrils, you can see the dye would naturally prefer the droplet phase. Therefore, you can see that really almost all the fibrils go to the interface rather than stay inside the droplets or go to the continuous phase. And if we do a cryo-SEM examination of the surface of the droplet, you can indeed see that the surface of these droplets are decorated with these densely packed nanofibrils. We repeated a lot of experiments systematically by varying the concentrations of the PEG and the dextrin that form the aqueous phases. And we saw that for all, the, uh, all of these different points, only the droplets in this gray region are stable. And these are the stable dextrin droplets in PEG solutions. And if we move to the right, we don't have any stable droplets. If we move towards the origins, we don't have any stable droplets. Remember, I told you that as we move from the origin outwards, the interfacial tension will increase. And so this dotted blue line actually corresponds to a surface tension value of about six micronewton per meter. And if we have an interfacial tension lower than that, we are not able to stabilize the, stabilize the droplets based on our observations. So we try to do some calculations to see whether this six micronewton per meter corresponds to anything special. When we multiply that by a, the rough total surface areas of all the droplets, 
the value of the energy actually turns out to be roughly equal to KT, thermal fluctuation. So above this surface tension, the nanofibrils absorbed to the interface with an absorption energy higher than the thermal fluctuations, and therefore will not be knocked away from the interface very easily. And so that may explain why droplets re can remain stable. Another boundary line is this red dotted line as we move from the left to the right of this dotted line, we will start to form that trend in um, PEG droplets rather than PEG. Uh, we will start to form the PEG in dextrin droplets rather than the dextrin in PEG droplets. Since the nanofibrils prefer to go to the PEG phase more, if the fibrils enter the interface from inside the PEG droplets, such as those in this case, it will be less effective in stabilizing the droplets because they are stabilizing from within rather than stabilizing from outside the droplets. So when we are going from the outside for the stabilization, the nanofibrils can act like cushions against coalescence with each other in this gray region. But um, when they're inside, they cannot have the same effect. And so that may explain why we have this red dotted line boundary. Another interesting thing that we also notice is that if we go to this region, which is supposed to be an unstable region because the surface tension will be too low and thermal fluctuations is expected to knock the nanofibrils out, making them ineffective for stabilization. However, if we continue to allow these nanofibrils to grow in size by polymerization, we can actually extend the stable region outwards. So this is one of the first demonstration of emulsion stabilizations through polymerizations of these protein fibrils after attachment to the um, interfaces. And the polymerization process can be thought of as a, as a growth process. If we add some permanent cross linker to the system, we can actually permanently cross link these fibrils and form these fibril capsules that we call fibrillosomes, which are uh, essentially protein vesicles uh, that can be potentially useful for um, encapsulations and release applications. Now, we also try to look at another characteristic, namely division. Now, if we try to uh, look at this uh, system again, we notice that if we add lysozyme nanofibrils to a very high concentrations, unlike in the previous case, then we'll have more than enough nanofibrils to stabilize the interface of the droplets and the remaining one will form a network at the center of the droplet. Then the excess nanofibrils forming the network inside the droplet can um, be used to provide some functional structural integrity to the droplet. So in this case, um, as we provide an osmotic shock to the droplets, sucking water out from the water droplets, the droplets with the network inside actually can start to show protrusions and eventually break up into smaller droplets. This is something that you don't see when the nanofibril concentrations are very low. Uh, and as you increase the fibril concentrations, you can you are essentially osmotically stressing your nanofibrils more, and you are dehydrating the droplet more. You can eventually cause them to break up into larger number of smaller droplets. We have this map that we can go from no division to single division and to multiple division. So this is division of droplets in the absence of any active energy supply to the system. The only changes we are introducing are the concentrations and the osmolarity of the system. So this brings us back to think about whether this dividing droplets may have anything to do with the budding or divisions in cells and also maybe in yeast, but we notice that obviously they are not the same because our very simple synthetic droplets do not have any cell membrane, unlike in many of these cells. These cell membranes typically are known to be very dynamic and uh, can regulate the transport of materials and molecules in and out of the cells. But in our uh, synthetic systems, we have none of that. Um, another feature that I like to um, talk about that is also quite important in biological drops is the dynamic assembly processes. So can we also assemble 
uh, things the same way in our synthetic droplets as they do in biological droplets. But before we can do that, I think we still need to have a much better understanding of the assembly at the interfaces of the biological droplets. Um, so we go back to something that is more known industrially or more known in the biomedical engineering or biomaterials community, which is the um, layer by layer um, assembly of polyelectrolyte. So typically we start with a charged particle, we put in alternate layers of poly polyelectrolytes with opposite charges. And then with the multiple layers assembled, you can then form these capsules after removal of the core by some very aggressive solvents. This is a process that is quite demanding and tedious. And I think I would have a very hard time if I had to insist my students to do something like this for me. So if you're one of those students who are very willing to uh, do things like that, please do contact me. You may be a good student for my group. Um, so since we have these water in water emulsion drops, we thought about whether we could just add the two oppositely charged polyelectrolytes to the droplet phase. And then the continuous, and then um, the continuous phase, we, we can then get them to assemble at the interface. And in fact, they can, assemble at the interface and we can form these capsules um, and then wall thickness can vary with the concentrations of the polyelectrolytes that we add. And also to our surprise, we do not only form these polyelectrolyte capsules and sometimes we form particles or microgels. This turns out to be an effect of the partitioning properties of the polyelectrolyte. So imagine if we have two aqueous phases that are immiscible with each other we call one of the drop. We call one the droplet phase A, and we call and we call the other um, the um, continuous phase B. If we add a water soluble polyelectrolyte to it, it need to decide. It need to choose whether to be more dissolved in A or more dissolved in B. And the relative ratio of the concentrations in these two phases define the so called partitioning coefficient. If it dissolves more in, for example, the dextrin phase then it has a higher partitioning coefficients in the dextrin phase. Our finding is that the structure of the polyelectrolyte aggregates depends a lot on the partitioning properties. If we add the polyelectrolyte that likes the droplet phase to the droplet phase, then there is less driving force for the polyelectrolyte in the droplet to move out of the droplet towards the continuous phase. So they tend to stay within the droplet and the outer polyelectrolyte occasionally, occasionally will diffuse into the droplets to stabilize them and to form a polyelectrolyte complex inside the droplet. So we end up having a polyelectrolyte particles or microgel rather than a capsules. However, if we add the polyelectrolytes that likes the continuous phase to the droplet phase, then it has a tendency to move outwards. And when it meets the oppositely charged polyelectrolyte, it will form the complex at the interface forming capsules like in these cases that I've shown. And so this is just an example of some common experimentally measured partitioning properties um, of these different polyelectrolytes in the two aqueous phases that we use very commonly. And we can repeat this process again and again to increase the number of polyelectrolyte layers. Since the assembly process as we just talked about depends a lot on the partitioning coefficient. We can also modify the partitioning coefficients to change the structure. For example, if we start below pH seven, then we can form capsules. If we start around pH nine, then we should form microgels according to this relative ratio of the partition, partitioning coefficient. And in fact, that's what we, that's what we can see from our experiments. This process also works for other macromolecules such as nanoparticles, proteins. If you add charged proteins to the systems and do similar things like we did to the polyelectrolyte, you can form these protein-protein hydrogel particles using the water-water emulsion as a template. Essentially, we are saying that by using the water-water emulsion drop as a template for forming materials, for forming particles, capsules, et cetera, we can take advantage of the partitioning coefficients to control the assembly and the particular structures that we can form. Obviously, when we are using water droplet in air or water droplet in oil, we cannot observe the same things because we do not have this partitioning properties. 
With this, I hope you are convinced, like I am, that this is a very useful system with IO and hydrothematic problem. We can take advantage of the properties of water water interfaces, and we can also incorporate some microfluidic techniques to achieve vital and cytopathic, dynamic, controllable, and selective structure and synthetic systems that can mimic our own. Using this system, in fact, a lot of people have been doing quite a lot of very interesting studies, both on the biological droplet side. For example, um, uh, Cliff Brangwing's group, um, and also on the synthetic side, such as uh, Christine Keating's group, which have which, which has done a lot of work using these phase separations in synthetic droplets for micro compartmentalizations for bioreactions. Another type of area that is also expected to play an increasing role is, um, for example, the use of these biocytocompatible systems to achieve responsive materials, patterns, structures by printing. But before we do that, there are several things that needs to be done. With printing, um, typically we can either start with using droplets or using liquid jets as the dispensing units to be printed. For the droplet, one way is to deposit the aqueous droplets that uh, I mentioned into an immiscible aqueous phase. And Professor Thomas, Tom Russell's group has demonstrated that you can form these droplets um, in very controllable manner in one of our collaborations. Um, another way is to use jets, as I mentioned, as the basic printing units. Our group has done some work using electric field and electric charging to control the behavior of a liquid jet you can see that for electrified jets, there are three regimes, the um, jetting, the uh, whipping, and the coiling regime. So this is the uh, whipping now in this video. So this is jetting, coiling, and whipping. And in particular, the coiling is a relatively new and less explored regime. And we came up with a relationship and an understanding that can unify the transitions of the three regime that enabled us to controllably print structures that, um, you, that uses coil-based basic units, such as the strict lines, meandering lines, alternating loops, translated coils as the basic printing units and print different patterns. If we want to print some functional cellular materials, we also need to have the ability to select the types of cells that we want and then assemble them in a subsequent step. Towards that end, we have to introduce a microfluidic system that allow us to collect an arbitrary number of droplets containing an arbitrary number of cells or other targets inside them. For example, within a mixture of um, green cells and red cells, we can use the system to not only isolate, but also sort and collect arbitrary number of um, droplets containing a single target cell, as you can see in these pictures. With a technique to identify and select the cells, we also have another technique for assembling ensemble of cells into cell sheets or cell monolayers using our aqueous interfaces. We can achieve an assembly of cells at the interface in a very well controlled and very well organized manner. For example, we can form um, monolayers of different types of cells with different numbers of cells and also um, mixture of cells and even hybrid mixtures of cells and particles. Um, so all of these together can help us achieve more controllable printing consisting of cell suspension at, as the ink to form certain cellular aggregates. And for some cells that need to uh, grow and tack along solid substrates, for example, rather than liquid compartments, we can also um, use microgel particles for encapsulating the single cells. There are different ways to do it. And one way is to first form a water in water double uh, emulsion, as you can see here. And then in the continuous phase, we can introduce another aqueous phase that can solidify the inner aqueous droplets. So here you can see that the inner droplets can be extracted simply by uh, put, dispensing these double emulsion droplets onto um, an aqueous solutions. And then we can uh, release the inner droplets and the inner droplets are readily solidified by the additives in, already in the underlying phase so that all these inner droplets can be can be uh, released and if with the right additive, they can be solidified to form 
microgel very conveniently at very high throughput, much higher than some of the other techniques that have been used for doing water water emulsions. And, um, and with that, then uh, we can achieve microgels with single cells inside them conveniently. All of these are in line with the rapid developments in all aqueous 3D printing. So hopefully um, leading to printing of not just synthetic structure, but also cellular structures or organized with functions. And these are indeed some of the works that have been uh, out there. For example, the works by Thomas Russell's group, uh, Tian Tian Kong's group, uh, Shrike Zhang's groups, and many other groups. So overall, I believe these all aqueous interface engineering has great potential. You can take advantage of the microfluidic control and the understanding of the intracellular liquid-liquid phase separations to go into templated material fabrication, bioprinting, biomimetics, cytomimetics, etc. And even for all these uh, systems, um, there are still some key challenges that need to be addressed. For example, the fundamental understanding of the nature of the aqueous aqueous interface, discovery and design of new aqueous uh, two-phase system, the materials uh, with different novel structures, etc. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and like to thank all the students that did all the uh, really good work. They are all wonderful students. So uh, many of the students who worked on these uh, include um, people like uh, Yu Chan, uh, Jing Mei, uh, Sibyl, um, Shi Pei, uh, Nanang, Deng Li, um, and uh, Teddy and uh, Jacob and Jing Xuan and many others. And of course, I have to thank my collaborators both in um, Hong Kong U and outside and our funding agencies. And uh, also again, I I like to thank the organizers for having the Microsystems and Nano Engineering Summit last year and for giving me the chance to speak here today as one of the young scientists. I would like to encourage everybody in the audience to have the strongest support to this wonderful, wonderful conference in 2020. It's going to be online, so it will be accessible to all of you, just like this talk. Thanks a lot again. Thanks a lot again. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks, Anderson, for you give this advertisement. Yeah, you're already a big demo here. Yeah, so uh, there are a few questions come out for you. Uh, first is, yeah, Professor Anderson. Yeah, it's amazing talk. So I'm wondering for the droplet division, does it limit to what to water, you know, interface, or it can be any liquid? Uh, you, the, aqueous phase, the aqueous phase operations actually is a pretty general uh, phenomenon. So that's a very good question. However, if you imagine if you want to have um, phase separation between water and oil, that phase separation does not happen at normal room temperature or normal room conditions. You may have to go to very elevated temperature or under very special um, conditions. But the advantage of aqueous phase operations is that you can achieve all of these at the same temperature simply by varying, for example, the concentrations by osmosis, etc., all without changing the environment drastically. And I believe that could also be one of the reasons why um, biological system, biological droplets tend to rely on um, aqueous phase operations rather than other systems. And likewise, if you um, think of some of these um, um, phase separation behaviors of between uh, gases and, and liquids, you can do that, but you may have to go to vacuum system and go to um, the extreme, more extreme environmental conditions. And so this aqueous two-phase system, aqueous, aqueous interface engineering, just provide a convenient platform and model for us to study many of these very intriguing phenomena that we can see. Okay, great. The second question is for the layer to layer assembly. Yeah, for mm. the drug delivery. Uh, is wor he's worried about how about the efficiency and how about the yield, you know, the, su the successful ratio. Yeah, can it be always 100% or 50% or something like that? I see. So that's also a fantastic question because I, I think um, you may imagine uh, if you go if you use some of the more conventional layer by layer process, the process can be very um, tedious, but people can still do it. With with this system, if you pick the right um, polyelectrolyte combinations, they can actually form the polyelectrolyte membrane quite robustly. So it's it's a matter of choosing the right system, and you can, for example, um, 
investigate that by studying the mechanical properties, by studying the assembly steps. All I am introducing here is a more convenient liquid in liquid platform because imagine in the previous uh, process, in the previous steps, if you want to form the eventual uh, capsules, you have to take advantage of an aggressive solvents to remove the uh, inner solid particles. But in our case, um, you don't have to do that. And after forming the uh, capsules in the aqueous two-phase system, you just you can just dilute the solutions, add water, so that the aqueous two-phase system will be, will be gone, and you can do that. And then in the end, the permeability, the uh, encapsulation efficiency, will depend on the choice of the combinations of the polyelectrolytes that forms the capsules. Okay, great. Last question is from me. So uh, you mentioned about the bioprinting, you know, in your last uh, few slides. I'm yes. wondering what's a big difference for the, you may know, you know, long time ago, it's a deep pen, the process, yes. you know, to yes. writing on all this. Yeah, so uh, what's a big difference between this? What's a big advantage of this bioprinting? Yeah, so um, that's, a very, that's a very good question as well. So I, I think um, the printing process itself is the same. We still use maybe a translated, translatable stage with different nozzles to dispense the liquid. But here, the liquid system allowed the chance for us to build in processes such as aqueous um, phase operations. And we can also use solutions that may be more amenable to the growth and sustainability of biological cells. And we can also take advantage of the partitioning properties to move the um, cells in the printing ink um, and compartmentalize them. So essentially, uh, this may provide us with a way to bring us closer to the type of hierarchical assembly, hierarchical structures that biological systems have seen. So um, I think the more traditional one um, uh, with the um, deep pen lithography or nano printing, etc., you have to rely on making the nozzle itself, next nozzle itself small enough to build the structure. But here we can take advantage of the aqueous phase separation process to enhance the complexity of the structure. And hopefully that is something that we can put to good use in the next um, year or so. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you, Anderson. Yeah, I thank want so to much. give you, deliver my certification for you. Yeah, so thank it's so uh, my great honor to have you here. Okay, let me see. Okay, I must turn on this. Okay, yeah, the question part. So, yeah, uh, I'm uh, so glad to have you here because the first time I was really attracted by the, you know, the, dump, uh, the dumping or the dumping, you know, the water that movies. So, uh, I'm happy to have you here. I uh, really great to see so many latest results from your group and it's exciting. So, I can ask the talks. Connect the world and universe by your technology. Anderson, that's for you. Thank you, Vavil Zhang, and thank you, everybody. It's a real pleasure and honor to have the chance to speak here. Okay, as you say that today is very special. We have this Mind Young Science Lectures. So, yeah, all the people here, Chun Jiang, Xie Xi, uh, Hou Xu, Professor uh, Cui, can you turn on your cameras to get on the stage? Yeah, please turn on your camera. Yeah. I'll have all of you get on the stage. Yeah. So everyone knows that actually today we are so happy because this was a group of people. So they are all from the event. And it's just, you know, emphasize on that is mine, the Young Scientist Lectures, uh, the uh, forum we run for several years. So you already heard the story from Chun Jiang, you will hear the story from Xie Xi and Hou Xu later. So now I want to give you some uh, uh, time, you know, to discuss all these young scientists, how they grow up so fast, how they're doing so well, you know. Uh, my first one well, to ask for Chun Jiang, uh, Chun Jiang, you know, I give you the nickname is like the Rocky. You really, you know, grow up really, really fast and doing so well. And then you found in the very special kind of area. You know, many, many people who was talking about soft electronic and something, so you found Robin, right? How you found that? Yeah. So, Dr. Dan, thank you very much again. Uh, 
I think um, I'm, uh, I like the nickname and I'm very humbled to accept it because, uh, you know, that's, uh, I'm a fairly a junior faculty and uh, we're still trying to grow. So, so yeah, hopefully we can do a better job in the next couple of years. Uh, in, in terms of the topic uh, we're choosing, actually, I think uh, uh, also I would like to thank my uh, former advisors, uh, Han Jin Jan at Arizona State and also John Rogers at uh, uh, Northwest now. So they really bring me into a very fantastic uh, uh, emerging field. And uh, I think uh, their working, especially their working style has been really inspired me. And uh, in particular, I would uh, say, this is uh, looking for a problem. It's, it's very important a step to uh, build up your career. And uh, what specific problem you, you're, gonna, you're gonna work with and also uh, being, being super critical to, to your career success. So I would, uh, I would say for, for my case, uh, so we actually have been really uh, trying to look into some of the challenging problems. And I think, uh, you know, the, how to uh, seamlessly to merging the biology and the, uh, the electronics, it's, it's really challenging. There are some of these uh, uh, solutions over there, but those solutions maybe uh, have some sort of uh, imperfections. So we want to really push the limit and try to uh, have this rubber electronics as one of the solvers, which my group also doing uh, several other technologies that uh, also, uh, you know, eventually can help in to solving this uh, great challenge. Okay, great. So, Xiexi, you're next to Tun Jiang. Yeah. So, oh, oh, Xiexi, can you hear me? Yeah. What are you doing now? Yeah. So, you look like from some other place, you know, like from space. Yeah. <laughs> because your glass always turning, you know, to different colors. Uh, it's okay. Can you hear me, Xiexi? Well, yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Okay. So that's great to have you here. Chen Jiang says, you know, it was uh, still growing in these areas. But I so you come back to, you know, mainland China just a few years. You came on the topic, uh, the productive is, uh, your group was very productive. Can you tell us some magic, you know, in Zhongshan University? <laughs> yes. Uh, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to share my, my experience here. Uh, as for me, I'm still a junior faculty and still there are a lot of space to grow. And for my uh, recent progress in China, actually, I, I did not imagine that I, I, I could get this space uh, when uh, several years before uh, Actually, I, I did not imagine that I could achieve so much progress for the for the for the for the several reasons. Yes, so, so basically, uh, yeah. So with my background, I I have been working on material science uh, during my PhD and postdoc. And at the beginning, when I come to Shenyang University, I try to start my own my lab on working on nano device. But sooner, I found that Shenyang University has very good facility and school of medicine. And at that time, I I think I could find some more important goal for my my, my nano device. That's why I try to merge my nano medical um, nano device with biomedical application. Uh, from that on, I, I'm looking for many collaboration with the biomedical school to, to find more useful application for my device. And surprising, surprisingly, um, we, 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 <coughs> we dig up many interesting application and those application have come up some very interesting results. So that's, uh, that's, that's Okay, it is great. I think you'll come back on the right time. 
because you know for biomedic and a hospital research now in Guangzhou is really rich, right? You can easily to get more collaborations, more support. So yeah, that give you big hands to on these topics. So congratulations. So Anderson, yeah, just now we all excited by you, you know, wonderful work. So how many students do you have? You look to have a bunch of, uh, you know, yeah, more than 10 or 20 students. Well, so I mean, in, in, in my group, uh, there are uh, different types of students. Some are PhD students, and uh, we also have some uh, the master's students. And then um, every year we get some uh, undergraduates um, to come and maybe start doing final year project and also spending maybe some part-time research there. And uh, some occasionally even we have uh, high school students. Um, because actually, wow. uh, I, I I was very fortunate when I was a high school student. I actually got an opportunity to go to a Technion in Israel to spend a summer doing research. And, uh, and when I was an undergraduate student, I also um, I, I also went to university's research group to perform the summer research. And I think these experiences really helped me um, in cultivating my interest in research. So we try to um, encourage and support students who are interested in doing that. So all in all, if you look at uh, all those uh, uh, people, then the, the groups look uh, pretty large. But the more permanent mem the more permanent members may be um, ab uh, above 10, between 10 and 15, and then uh, occasionally um, we have many um, undergraduate assistants or other assistants. Wow, you are a young star in Hong Kong. Now you already start to nurse you know, the even younger generations. Yeah, even yes. high school students. How happy they should be Yeah, in your group to see all these wonderful things. I think more kind of a scientists will come out from your group. Because yeah. they bring much fresher ideas than what we can have, and um, I all I'm always happier when my students prove me wrong. I'm always happier when my students uh, do things I cannot envision. And uh, actually, um, if they do that, then I basically am am very happy every day going to work and, and learning from them and uh, working together. Okay, cool. So Hoshi, now it's your turn. Yeah, you are in Xiamen University. You really develop a new field. So can you tell us the back stories for, you know, how you found this kind of trait to develop this new field? Many people have never heard of that. Yeah. Thank you for a question. So for me, just like, because I like uh, watch the science fiction movies, uh, you know, and also there are many inspiration from this move, from many scientific uh, fiction movies. So my current and most of my current research uh, interest, my, I, mean, I mean, the research direction is inspired by a Stargate. I, later I will talk about this uh, story about how it inspired me to do my current research. Thanks. So yeah, it's decided yeah. you can control, you know, several different phases, you know, to get together. That's really, really exciting. So yeah, just, yeah. I just want to like play, play with water as a, you know, as a okay. gate. So. <laughs> I will give it details later, yeah. Yeah, Thanks. so that's really interesting. So all this for, you know, young scientists come out is because of one people. Yeah, one person. Yeah, one super scientist who is still next to, you know, to this for young generation, uh, young science. It's Professor Tian Feng Tui. So, Tui, uh, Professor Tui, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I want you, you know, give you more time to introduce about uh, how you founding all these young generations, how you nursing all of them. Yeah, please. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chang. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice introduction. And it's uh, always my great pleasure to interact with young scientists. I'm feeling old when you guys uh, make a wonderful talk like uh, Chen Jiang and Anderson, and it will be followed by another two talks uh, from uh, Xu and then uh, and then Xi, uh, Xi uh, later on. Uh, so we start the Young Scientist Forum uh, actually ever since uh, 2017. Uh, this is because of the journal. Uh, you know, uh, starting from uh, uh, 2014, we have the first. Uh, uh, microsystem and nano engineering submit. Uh, at that moment, we are trying to set up uh, a conference to support a new journal that we launched in 2015. Uh, the journal, the title is uh, Microsystem Nano Engineering. 
that's a, a popular journal uh, of nature publishing group uh, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So in uh, 2015, we have the journal launched. Ever since 2014, we have the annual uh, conference that been uh, organized. And then later on, uh, proposed by our associate editor, Professor Alice Zhang, uh, starting from 2017, that actually have the first uh, young scientist uh, uh, forum that's as part of the summit. And it's becoming a very successful section uh, ever since the first uh, uh, first forum, because we have uh, really rising stars all over the world come over to the conference year at the beginning of July. And a group of people together, they uh, share their uh, wonderful research uh, to the research community. And we are very, we have been very impressed by their outstanding work as they talk today. So uh, the first conference was in Dalian, uh, China, and then moved to uh, Beijing in uh, 2018. And last year we had the conference in, uh, in Shanghai. And uh, actually out of the uh, uh, four speakers, uh, all outstanding uh, young scientists, uh, three got the uh, uh, award last year. Uh, Chindia was not uh, part of the, the conference. Last year they got the Young Scientist Award and we were very impressed by their thought. And uh, this conference will, will continue. Uh, next year, we, I mean, this year we have the, the, the conference again. Out of last year's conference, we also invited the, uh, uh, you know, uh, young scientists to submit their paper uh, to the journal, uh, Microsystem Nano Engineering. And you, you see there are three uh, papers being highlighted. That's uh, from the uh, three speakers. And actually they, they published their outstanding work in the journal. And you see the beautiful cover. Uh, that's actually uh, be, be the special issue of the young scientists. We are going to continue the special issue. We're going to use the nature plant to promote the young scientists because uh, we, uh, we are interested in their work and they're really the future. They're the writing stars in the research committee. As the, uh, as the, uh, the uh, executive editing chief uh, work for us uh, support their work to the next level using the current existing uh, platform of nature and uh, you know, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Back to the, the journal, the journal is the first engineering journal of uh, nature publishing group uh, that been set up uh, in 2014 and this, uh, this journal growing very well and we're very much uh, uh, you know uh, supporting a young scientists not only as uh, as a uh, publication platform but as actually more uh, as a uh, uh, you know academic exchange platform are going to move forward uh, and continue to support young uh, young scientists to the next level uh, with this, actually, you can see uh, the work being, uh, being, being shared today by the two scientists already. There are another uh, two talks followed. Uh, you, from the screen, you can see their groups. I was very uh, uh, surprised to see these groups uh, have been doing uh, so much work with uh, a large amount of, uh, uh, a large number of students. They have a big army as a young scientist, uh, you know, uh, in their uh, for only a few years after their PhD, uh, so they will establish in the research community. So that's actually, uh, as the executive editor in chief of the journal, uh, as the uh, you know uh, uh, scientists in the community, we really want to uh, you know promote their work and actually support their uh, research uh, whenever you need. Uh, the young scientists have some uh, you know need some support. Please, please let us know. So with this, I will get back to Alice. Uh, Alice, probably you can continue to talk about the uh, MAN 2020. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you, Professor Tui. Actually, I really appreciate your big uh, support for all this young generation, especially, you know, they can publish papers, you know, not only to, you know, uh, win the award, but they also publish papers they all can highlight on the nature, you know, uh, the website and uh, get promoted. That's a really a great chance. So we continue this because this year, yeah, will be in July. Uh, 7 to 10th, 2020, we will have this Young Scientist Forum uh, online. So it's a, a three days talk and a one day was a, a award ceremony. So the details of this I will give you in this slide. So we have a, a 
six sessions, we have uh, 54, uh, you know, uh, candidates. So the whole event will be hosted in these four days. So welcome everyone to join us and welcome everyone, you know, to uh, get involved. Uh, it's a stage for the young scientists, it's a stage for everyone. Uh, I think I want to ha have many, many young scientists as this for. Yeah, so I think that's a real future. That we are nursing more and more students, you know, young generation to get into the science and technology. This is a real backbone, you know, for the society. This is really, really, really what we need to do. Uh, so after this uh, uh, short, you know, uh, dialogue, I think it's time to go back to the, you know, talks. So Professor Cui, you will introduce the, you know, following two speakers. Uh, okay, sure. here is your turn.